Good morning, friends. My name is Claire. I serve on staff here at the church and also as seventh grade girls on Wednesday nights. I'm going to be reading today's text, and we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body... We have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who acts of the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. I'm thankful to be here with you today. Uh, I'm glad for those of you who were able to make it. Uh, Y'all are the hardcore attenders who braved braved the uh, icy temperatures and difficult roads and the pandemic. And so you can just like give yourself a couple extra Sunday school points for making it here on one of the difficult days where a lot of people were not able to. If you're watching us online, we're grateful to have you as well. No, many of you weren't able to be here. Uh, we have a lot of people out sick right now. So if you would uh, uh, remember our church in particular in your prayers uh, as well as your loved ones, that's all right. You can pray for them as well. Uh, we've been in a series called Growing in the Gospel. Where in here, here's what we know: Jesus Christ went to the cross for you and for me, and He died not just that we might have life one day in eternity, but Jesus Christ went to the cross that we might begin living the abundant life in Him right here, right now, today, and we continue to live that life all the way through into eternity. Uh, but that doesn't come naturally. We live in a difficult world. We face a lot of, uh, of challenges in terms of our culture and the, the beliefs and practices. And so for us to live as disciples in the abundant life of Jesus, um, it's not always easy. And so in this series, we've been talking about how to grow in the gospel. And the reason we say grow in the gospel is when, when we talk about growth in our relationship with Jesus Christ, we're not talking about more self-effort, more work on your part, like you decide you're going to do it, but rather uh, we look to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We look to him, who he is, what he has done, and that is the impetus for our growth. And so um, week one of this series, we talked about sowing and reaping. You sow to please your flesh, you're going to reap destruction, but if you sow to please the Spirit, you're from uh, the Spirit going to reap abundant and eternal life. And so that's joy for us, that God has given us of the Spirit that we might begin to live out this abundant life, the fullest most satisfying, most joyful life you could ever live in the Spirit of God. And then last week we saw that God has given us His Word. If you want to know um, what steps do I need, need to be taking, how do I follow after Jesus Christ so to please the Spirit, God has given us His Word to teach us and to guide us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now this week we're going to see the third gift God has given us as believers in Jesus Christ uh, to help us walk as disciples of His. And that gift, believe it or not, is the church. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, you may know the passage if you've been around church for very long. You've probably heard this quoted many times. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 is going to point us toward the church of Jesus Christ to help grow us and to sanctify us, okay? So go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 12, and then I've got to do a little bit of background work for you. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore. Um, If you've been around church for very long, preaching or reading your Bible, you know that when you have the word therefore, that the information that comes after uh, is going to assume that you know what he's already said before. 
Now, this, therefore, is a little bit unique in that it's in the 12th chapter of the letter to Romans, and yet this, therefore, most scholars would agree, um, actually points us back to everything the Apostle Paul has already said in the book of Romans. They're not like a more immediate context, like, I'm your dad, therefore you do what I say, but instead it's based on everything that he's already said in the letter. So let me just pick, catch you up, if you will, on what the Apostle Paul has taught us in his letter to the Romans. I'm not going to do it all justice. You have to read it all for yourself if you want the full story. But here's the summary. Romans chapter 1, we see that the wrath of God is being revealed against sin. That God is perfect in all of his ways, that sin and God are incompatible. Thus, uh, sin is due the wrath of God. That is coming. And then Romans 3, we see that um, not only is God's judgment going to be given against sin, um, it gets complex here because we see in Romans 3.23 that all of us have sinned, and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And so the problem gets a lot more personal in chapter 3. Yes, the wrath of God against sin, and it just so happens that I'm sinful. Therefore, I'm an object of God's wrath, or potentially would be. Romans 6, we see that the wages of our sin, the punishment for our sin is death. You're like, Hey, this is the most depressing book in history. Why would I want to read this? This is not good news at all. But at the end of Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We have one of those big butts that we like to see in Scripture where we stop looking to ourselves and our inadequacy, inadequacy and we start looking to God. Um, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And how do we get there? Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. That in the midst of our sin, not when we cleaned ourselves up in order to make ourselves palatable before God, like, hey, God, I'm a pretty good guy now, I'm a pretty good gal. No, no, no. While we were still in our sin, Jesus Christ died for us. He knew every one of your sins, and he chose willingly to go to the cross to offer himself as a sacrifice for you. Jesus went to the cross and he paid the just penalty for my sin and for your sin. And he fulfilled that completely. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus on the cross. The wrath that we deserved, he endured. And that leads us to Romans chapter 8 verse 1 which says, there is now therefore, because Jesus paid it all on the cross, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you don't have to worry about who you once were. Like you're not uh, your sin. You're not your past. You're not your mistakes. You are now, because of Jesus Christ, you've been set free from that. There's no condemnation left for you. And so there's hope. There's much to celebrate. The gospel is called good news because we blew it all. Like we, we made every mistake. Sake. We sin completely, and Jesus Christ, in His grace, God who loved us, sent Christ to the cross for us. And that is good news. Jesus went to the cross not just to save us from sin, but also to purchase for us a new, abundant, eternal life. And that's what we have said. We want our church to begin to live this out day to day, the joyful, the most satisfying, fulfilling life that we could possibly live, the life most fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. And so, how do we grow in the gospel? I'm glad you asked. We're going to read that here in verse 12. Now that we've got the context, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, as a result of the gospel, as a result of what Jesus Christ has done for you, as a result of what he's purchased for you on the cross, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. And so Paul's like, <clears throat> look back to the mercy that God's shown you. Remember your sin? Remember those things that you're so ashamed of? People you hurt? Mistakes that you made? Remember that God didn't give you punishment for that? Instead, he showed you his grace and his mercy. He's like, look back on the mercy that God has shown to you. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. So every other religion of the world, here's how it goes. Um, 
God is angry with you or you want to get into good, God, God's good favor, you need to offer a sacrifice to him. If you want to receive mercy, you better offer a sacrifice. That's how it goes. And almost every religion in the world is practiced in you know, various ways. There were you know, child sacrifices or whatever throughout history. Um, we spent time in China a few years ago and went to their temple. And when you go into the temple, it's really ornate, uh, kind of the, the Chinese architecture that you would think of, this huge and vast temple. And you would go in, and you would have to spend some cash if you wanted to go worship in this temple. You, uh, people would buy firecrackers, interestingly enough. That's, that's a church I can get behind. Service, right? That's a lively one. Um, they would buy firecrackers. They would buy fake money. And then all these other offerings, if you will. And what they would do is they would go in to kind of a courtyard area. And there was a place where you would light off your firecrackers in this kind of metal, this big steel tube. And it was super loud, by the way. I, it, was, it, would, it would hurt your ears. And that was their attempts to get the gods to wake up, that maybe the gods would hear them if they would light these firecrackers. And they would burn incense or they would light the fake money on fire. And then they would make their way up to the steps where all these little weird-looking gods were in an attempt to appease them. They would leave, leave food or uh, money or various sacrifices that they would offer to these gods in order to get in their good graces. But what you need to know about Christianity is that we do not make sacrifices in order to attain mercy or to get God's mercy. We make sacrifices because we've already got it. God gave us his mercy first, and therefore we offer ourselves as sacrifices to him. This is kind of the case that Paul makes when he says here, this is your spiritual worship. Now, your translation may say, reasonable or acceptable act of worship. The Greek word there is logikos, which we're, from which we get our modern day word logic. He's like, when you look back to what Jesus Christ has done for you, when you consider the gospel, what you and I deserved, what we earned for ourselves, which was punishment, it was death, it was wrath, and yet God gave to you his mercy, you know the only reasonable response to Jesus saving us in spite of our sin is to offer ourselves to him as living sacrifices. Now, Old Testament, you know about sacrifices, something had to die. If sins were going to be forgiven, someone, something had to die there. And yet in the New Testament, because Jesus Christ offered himself once for all, there's no more dead sacrifices, but rather we get to be living sacrifices unto God, offering ourselves to him in life rather than death. That's a really, really good option if you need to sacrifice yourself, that you get to do it in life. And not only that, this is what the abundant life looks like, offering ourselves to the God who offered himself first for us, right? Jesus wants you to live the abundant life. He wants to set you free from your sin. He wants to lead you to abundance in him. And so he, he continues on here to kind of point us to, to kind of one of two paths that you're going to take with your life. And he says, do not be conformed to this world. Now, this is, this is something that when, when we leave here or when you go about your day, you're interacting with your coworkers, if you're in, in school, this is happening to you. The world, the, the, the beliefs, the philosophies, the systems, the behaviors of this world are pressing against you. And you will either be conformed to this world, you will begin to adopt the beliefs, the philosophies, and the behaviors of the world around you, or you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, the Greek word for transformed here is the Greek word metaphor -ao, so or metamorph -ao. Uh, So metamorphosis is where we get our word, which means to be transformed in, in appearance or character or condition. And so what the Apostle Paul is telling us is rather than giving ourselves to the world and saying, hey, have your way with me, right? I'm going to be conformed to you. Instead, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God to be transformed by him. And he, he shows us the result. Then you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable, and what is perfect. You want to sow to please your spirit that you might reap abundant and eternal life? Man, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Um, we renew our minds by the Spirit of God, where we walk by the Spirit and not according to our flesh. What does the Spirit desire for me? Uh, the, the second way we renew our minds is through the Word. What does the Word of God have to say about that? And the third way that we renew our minds is in partnership, in fellowship with the church of Jesus Christ. 
he's going to go on and tell us um, what it looks like to live your life as a living sacrifice. And the first place he points us to is the church. You want to know what it looks like to offer yourself to God? As a result of his mercy and the gospel, offering yourself as a living sacrifice to him, he's going to point us to the church. Look here in verse 3. He says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but, to, but with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. We belong to one another. Members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, we could carry this on. Um, if you're a, a, an amazing musician, kind of like myself, I don't know why they don't use me, then you should lead out in worship. If you are someone who's just a gifted servant, you should serve in proportion to the faith that God has given you, offering yourself as a living sacrifice first to the church of Jesus Christ. In view of all that God has done, offer yourself. Now, he, he warned us just before this, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? You know what the pattern of this world is with regard to most any organization or, or thing out there? The question that we ask when we're going to kind of decide Am I going to go? Am I going to, you know, commit to it? What level am I going to commit? The, the question that we most often ask is, what's in it for me? What am I going to get? Right? I mean, if, I, if I'm going to go to most places, and listen, we're busy people. we got lots going on. We're affluent. We have lots of opportunities coming our way. And we have to ask ourselves, is it worth it, right? What am I going to get out of this? Am I going to commit myself or not? And many people, when they think about church, Rather than being transformed and saying, wait, 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 this is my spiritual act of service. This is the only reasonable thing I could do is offer myself and God, to God. Instead, oftentimes we're more conformed to the world. What's in it for me? And so we think about a church that we want to attend based upon, well, do I like the preacher and how are the, the facilities? You know, the, the seats have plenty of cushion because I don't want to go to the, one of those old Baptist churches with the hard pews, right? I've been there. That, that, those Sundays get long, right? Not into those. Well, how do they do for my kids? How good is the music? Do they sing the right kind of songs? You know, are they too country for me? Are they too rock? You know, whatever. We, we evaluate what's in it for me. And yet what the Apostle Paul is pointing us to here. You want to live out the abundant life in Christ Jesus? You want to offer yourself in worship to him to know what is good and pleasing and perfect, that you might sow to please the Spirit and from the Spirit reap this abundant life? You know, offer yourself as a living sacrifice to the church. So uh, the main overall point that I want to point you to today is the way that we offer ourselves. And the first way that Paul would tell us in this, uh, in this book uh, is to offer ourselves as living sacrifices by belonging to and participating in the local church. You want to know the abundant life. You want to know what it is to live as a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. And give yourself to, belong to, and participate in the local church church. Don't just kind of dip your toe in the water. Like there's been this weird American phenomenon where we decided that we attend church. The church is something that we go to. It's the hour on Sunday morning. You know, if you're really hardcore, you hit Sunday school before or maybe a Wednesday night. But church is something that we attend. And, and that is not at all a, a biblical understanding of church. A church is something that we are. When we belong to Jesus Christ, we belong to his church. And as a result of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul says, offer yourself as living sacrifices there, belonging to and participating in the body of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't happen all that much anymore. If you were to kind of read statistics, kind of nationwide statistics for the Church of America, um, membership is almost evaporating. People are like, why would I want to commit myself to that? What does it even matter? Why would I bother? What do I get out of it, right? I'm not sure I want to be a member of the church. I'm not sure I want to be under the authority of the elders. I'd rather just kind of decide for myself what's right and wrong, right? I don't want to have to submit myself to difficult people. If I don't like it there, I'd rather just go somewhere else, right? I don't want to do that. What I believe is that is conforming 
right, more to American culture than the teaching of Scripture. Uh, in particular, the Apostle Paul, he tells us that we are individually members of one another. Why is it so important that we belong to and participate in the local church? Number one, you need the church. I know it may not feel like it. I know it may feel like, you know what, me and God, I get up in the morning, I have time in the Word, I'm praying all day, like I'm driving, I'm praying, I, I have church in the deer stand, right? What, we can have church wherever and whenever we are. And let me just say, you can walk with God wherever, wh you know, whenever, you know, it should happen throughout your day. You should walk with God. That is not church, right? That is your personal relationship with Christ. I encourage it fully. We say, devote yourselves daily, every day, all day, devote yourself to the Lord. Um, however, you need the church of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Paul gives us a warning on the front end against any sort of thinking that says, eh, you know what, I think I'm okay. I think I can handle this on my own, walk with God, I don't need them, whatever, I'm fine. And he says for the, in verse 3, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but instead with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. One of my, my good friends in high school, who I get to report to you, by the way, is now walking with God. Uh, our conversations are much more joyful than they once were, right? Um, they're, uh, before, uh, they, were, they were difficult, right? So um, in high school, I was a wrestler, and I, was at, I wrestled at a, a ferocious 135 pounds. I was pretty intimidating out there, uh, 135. Um, and there was only one guy on our team that was smaller than me. Uh, he wrestled at 125, right? Uh, and he was my good friend who, again, now walks with the Lord. Uh, but something miraculous happened to him um, after he had a couple of drinks. That 125-pound, 5'7 guy, man, he would grow. And he would grow. Like he went from 5'7 to 6'4, from uh, two, uh, 125 to 225 rather quickly. As a matter of fact, he, uh, you know, after a few drinks, he would really believe that he was the biggest and baddest guy in any room, and then he would act like it. So he would often find the biggest and baddest guy in any room and, you know, uh, mouth off a little bit. And those of us who were sober were like, Dude, you're not going to win this fight. This is not going to end well for you. We had to pull him out of many places and many different times because he was going to, I mean, he was going to get destroyed. Like he thought, uh, I, I, I can do this. I can. And listen, it was just going to go badly for him. Many of us and the Apostle Paul would warn us against such thinking. Maybe you don't have to have a few drinks in you to think this, but maybe just as a result of our cultural influence, you have begun to believe, I don't need the church. I can handle this on my own. And you've looked at yourself and you think, no, 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 I do pretty well. I can, I can do it. And, and if that's your belief, I, I want to encourage you. I think you've misjudged yourself. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think with sober judgment. We all knew my buddy was not 6'2", 225, right? We knew he was the smallest guy in the room and it wasn't going to go well for him. And it's often true that we see it in the church. I've been in ministry full-time for 18 years now. And people that think, eh, I don't really need to be connected. And they go through this cycle. They'll kind of connect in the church, and then they slowly fade away. They get busy with the things of life, other things going on. And the next thing you know, you hear about the disaster of their life. Do not be misled. God will not be mocked. You sow to please your flesh. You will from the flesh reap destruction. Let me encourage you. I want to say this with clarity. The reason why you need to belong to and participate in the local church is because you need the church. You need godly men and women in your life that you will submit yourself to, that can call you on your stuff, tell you the hard things when you're going the wrong way, when you're headed down the wrong path. You need people in your life that, you, that love you and know you well enough to say, hey, you're going the wrong way. You need to look up. Or when life gets difficult and you're down, you need people who can encourage you and care for you and build you up. As long as the days are good, right? There are times where you need to celebrate the goodness of God. They can help you renew your mind, both in the good and in the bad. You need the church of Jesus Christ. Um, got to watch county tournament, a little bit of basketball this week. My son, uh, is uh, he's a seventh grader. He was playing with the eighth grade. And... Uh, 
man, I, I was honestly blown away. wasn't much of a basketball player myself. I, I was a wrestler because I had to be. Uh, I didn't have an option to play basketball. I wasn't good enough, right? And so watching these kids play, even at that young age, really impressed at some of them and the coordination that it takes to think about like a body and all the moving parts, you know, head and shoulders, knees and toes, and all the things in between, right? And these guys, um, while they have a team that's trying to defend against them, they're able to like be scanning the court for their pass or an open lane for a shot. Um, they're able to dribble without looking at it, right? Work their way around defenders. They're jumping and contorting their bodies in the air and making shots even in the face of pressure. Like It's really impressive to see like, what those guys can do. And yet... Even one part of the body that fails, and none of that stuff happens. Uh, a few years ago, we were doing a vacation Bible school at Pecola, and I uh, was over games with the kids, and there was a group of kids, and we were playing Duck, Duck, Goose because I'm not all that imaginative, and, and we're having a good time. Now, mind you, I'm not playing the game. I'm supervising the game. Um, and they're, you know, chasing each other and, and all that. And I decided I was going to kind of get a different vantage point. And I went to take a step. And um, at that point, I had a torn ACL. And uh, ACL, you don't have to have it to walk. Um, you just have to have it to be able to trust yourself to walk, right? You just never know when that thing is going to go. And so right there in front of those kids, I'm not playing the game. I'm not doing anything, you know, all that stellar. Knee goes, and I fall flat on my face right beside the duck, duck, goose circle. And there's a little kid like patting me on the back like, are you okay, mister? And I'm like, yes, I'm fine, you know, kind of embarrassing. But to be honest with you, the church in America performs a lot like me supervising a duck, duck, goose game than we do those kids that I watch, those bodies performing those athletic feats at a basketball game. Because the truth of it is, there are so many parts of the body that we simply can't depend upon. People have come to believe the lie that I don't need the church. And the enemy's just having his way. What I want to see are men and women who understand that God has given the church to us as a gift to build us up, to strengthen us, to help renew our minds, to uh, keep us from giving in to the, the patterns of this world and instead to point us to the patterns of Christ. Now, you can overestimate yourself. I don't need the church. But there's another way that you can look to yourself and end up in almost as much trouble. Um, and that's the person who doesn't say, listen, they might know they need the church. It's not that I don't need the church. It's that the church doesn't need me. Some of you are out there, and you're living like, like Christ has never done anything for you. You're living like you don't have the Holy Spirit of God in you. What you're doing is looking in the mirror and saying, man, I'm not that gifted. I can't sing like Haley sings. I'm not all that charismatic of a person. I can't teach, and I'm, I'm not good at a lot of things. I can't, I can't, I can't. And the standard by which we are to judge ourselves with sober judgment, he says, according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Listen, our faith isn't in ourselves, right? Our faith is in Jesus Christ. When you think about whether or not you want to belong to and participate in the church of God, I want to say this. You need the church, and the church needs you. The sovereign God of the universe has distributed the gifts of the church to the church just as he desired, which means he knew what he was doing when he gifted you. But for many of us, to serve in the church, to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to the people around us, it's a bit of a step of faith. Because when we look in the mirror, we know that we can't do it. And I've been in, in hospital rooms. And families are grieving, and rightly so. And I can't heal an illness, and I can't comfort anxious hearts. And the whole time I'm there, I'm just praying, God, I can't do anything here. Would you do this? And to be honest with you, that's how every one of us should serve every single week. Every single time, God, I can't do this. Man, I can't, I can't lead people. I, I can't teach people. I need your spirit to work through me. It's independence upon him. You need the church. Why do we belong to and participate in a local church? Because you need the church. Number two, the church needs you. But here's the beauty of this. The third part of this is that serving in faith, it begins to strengthen our faith. 
when we offer ourselves to God, when we kind of take those steps of faith and we see that God would use us in a situation when we know we had nothing to offer, and it strengthens our faith in God. Like, look what God has done. If you knew me and Josh Schneider from the time we were young men, your faith in Jesus Christ would be strengthened, that he would ever stand up here and lead worship on this stage, and I would ever stand up here and preach. That is the grace of God, y'all. I don't understand it. I wouldn't have picked us either. It is the work of Jesus Christ that does that. And listen, I believe that God wants to use you. There is this thing where we can kind of come in and rather than offering ourselves to God as living sacrifices, we can kind of do what's easy and comfortable and we don't really have to depend upon the Lord. And you're missing out because serving in faith strengthens our faith that we could be built up and strengthened together as the body. Now, here's how this looks for us practically. I think that every person here, every person listening, uh, wherever you are, if you don't live here, you're not connected to this church, I believe that you need to belong to and participate in a local church. You need to submit yourself to elders that you will follow uh, a church with sound doctrine. You need to gather yourself with a group of people, and you need to do life deeply with them. So here's how that looks here. Uh, the first thing that we ask our people to do, our members, we ask people to gather consistently week after week to be here. Now, I get it. There are snow days. There are days when COVID's going crazy and they're shutting schools down where we may not make it. There are vacations. There are times uh, we're not like the Nazi church going to check. Like you gotta, at the end of the year, you got to have a stack of bulletins to prove that you made it. That's not what this is about. But rather, we are a people who look back to the mercies of God. We see that our good God has called us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, as members of this body. And we gather here consistently to have our minds renewed through the fellowship, through the preaching of the word, through singing songs that remind us of the truth. So we ask our members to gather consistently. The second thing that we ask our people to do is to commit themselves to community. Um, throughout the New Testament, there are about 40-something one-anothers um, listed that believers are expected to do. Jesus would teach us, love one another. Uh, the vast majority of those one-anothers do not take place on a Sunday morning. They can't, right? I mean, for the way that this is generally set up, I'm, I'm standing up here talking and you're listening. We're not doing a lot of one-anothering right now. And yet, what we see, the model of the early church in Acts they would gather in Solomon's colonnade, and they got to hear Peter preach. It had to be extraordinary. And yet what they intuitively understood was that was not enough. Because they would leave Solomon's colonnade, and they would gather house to house. And they would share a meal together. And they would dive in in prayer together with one another. They would confess their sins to one another. If you want to do that publicly, come on, we'll do it. But for the most part, I'd rather do it with the, you know, the few guys that have my community group that know me and love me that I can trust, right? Confessing your sins one to another, spurring one another on toward love and good deeds, offering ourselves to care for one another when they're down. Um, you need people that know you well enough that they know your tendencies towards sin, that they're actively praying against that, that they know where you failed and they can hold you accountable, and they know when you need encouragement and how to build you up. You need to walk through life more deeply with people than will ever happen here on a Sunday morning. Again, the church isn't something that we attend. It's who we are. It's the life that we live. It's who God has called us to be, living sacrifices before him. So we say, gather consistently, um, commit yourselves to community. And we say commit because I'm not going to pretend like it's always easy. You know, one of the one another's in Scripture is to bear with one another. It gives us a picture of long suffering. Sometimes it's going to be really difficult with the people in your group. And you're going to have to Bear with them through difficult seasons of loss or pain or whatever it might be. And that's not always easy. But we commit ourselves to one another because we belong to one another. Uh, the final thing that I would say for you here is find a place to serve. Begin to use your gifts and watch what God does. Begin serving in faith. If, if you don't know how to do that, we can connect with you in the Welcome Center. We will help you get plugged in. We can plug you in right now, as a matter of fact. This is one of those mornings where a lot of volunteers are out. We can get you plugged in. But here's what happens. You just begin to serve. And maybe it's not the best fit. Maybe it's not your perfect fit. But as you begin to serve, you see better how God has gifted you and where you might better fit. And we, we heard a story uh, this, just a couple weeks ago uh, about a, a mom who comes here 
and is so thankful for a nursery volunteer that you may not know her name, but she faithfully serves back there week in and week out. Nobody sees her unless your kid is in that room, uh, but that mom was just so thankful because her kid, um, when she's back there in the nursery, she knows her kid cannot wait to go. He's going to be back there. He's going to have people that love him. He's going to hear about Jesus Christ, and they get to sit out here, and they're not getting paged every five minutes because the kid's discontent. You know, They get to enjoy worship with the body of Christ. Uh, I spoke to a woman this morning in tears after the first service. I said, um, I don't know her name, but seven years ago, there was a lady serving in your recovery ministry, and my son showed up, and he wasn't walking with Christ. He didn't know Christ at the time, but she showed him so much kindness that he kept coming back, and he doesn't live here to go to this church anymore, but God has done a profound work, and it was through simple acts of kindness, serving in the body of Jesus Christ. Never discount what the Spirit of God can do through someone just like you. It's not us, y'all. It is the Spirit of God at work in us and through us. And so we just offer ourselves to Him, serving in faith, which ultimately strengthens our faith and builds us up and makes us better prepared to go out and face the world the rest of the week. And so my encouragement, belong to and participate in the local church. If you don't think this is the one for you, man, we would love to have you here, uh, but I, I get it. But I would still challenge you. Go belong to and participate in a local church because you need the church and the church needs you and because serving in faith strengthens our faith. Let's pray. Lord, we, we're thankful, God, for the great salvation that you've given to us. Lord, that you knew all of my sin, all the ways that I would fail you, and yet you chose to go to the cross and endure the punishment that I deserved. God, we praise you for the mercy that you exhibited there on the cross. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that that would offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you. And Lord, one of the ways we do that is by loving and serving in our church. And I pray that for every man and woman here that we would be strengthened that we would live out the abundant life in Christ Jesus in the context of, of church and then as we go back into the world. Lord, we need you And so, Lord, I pray that you would guide us, that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would lead us today. Give us the the grace to obey, to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.